So let's start um, by, um, good evening, everyone. If you are anywhere near Greenwich uh, time uh, and a hello for uh, all of you and whatever and across any different timestamp you may be. Uh, so welcome to the second lecture uh, of the Drawing Forward Lecture Series number two. Uh, once more, I thank all of this amazing uh, um, lecturers and their generosity in offering valuable uh, time presenting and discussing their amazing work. Just a quick recap on, on, on Drawing Forward. Um, Drawing Forward, our lectures continue to delve into ways of framing drawing as a research, uh, looking at the idea that architecture can be a remarkable conduit uh, for the cultural debate that addresses 21st century issues that go beyond just uh, functional or programmatic problem solving. Visual constructs have the capacity uh, to not only engage as a methodological tool, as well as change the architect's conceptions of reality and influence the reader interpretation of a piece of work, which in turn transforms theories into new forms of knowledge. At its core, drawing forward presses on the idea of going beyond the givens in architecture and expanding the tool sets in which architects and spatial practitioners operate within. When we work at this kind of level, we allow for collaborative practice and working with other subject areas, creating interesting discussions to advance and progress ideas through the sharing of thinking. And this is how new knowledge is created. For this eve, I am delighted to introduce architect, designer, and educator, Matthias Del Campo. Matthias will be captivating us with his talk titled Neural Architecture, Design, and Artificial Intelligence. Um, so brief synopsis. Uh, neural architecture uh, is the field of architecture that is primarily preoccupied with interrogating the emergent field of artificial neural networks, ANNS, as a design method. This lecture presents an attempt to utilize deep learning, DL, and machine learning, ML, to capture the salient features of existing architecture in order to interrogate this data for their underlying architectural qualities. What is meant by underlying architectural qualities? The rationale explanation would include aspects such as spatial layout, sectional distribution of volume, the dialogue with its environment, the volumetric balance, the material qualities of design, the structural properties, etc. All of which can be explored with the help of ML processes. However, this lecture maintains that architecture is more than just an assemblage of rational properties. This might explain the obsession with neural art, which represents an excellent mirror of our contemporary age, particularly regarding our shared agency with quasi-intelligent machines and their observation of the world. Can architecture do the same? Can neural networks help interrogate the latent uh, layers within the geological deposits of the history of architecture and then assemble those found features into inherto unseen designs? There is no doubt that this is the right time for a discussion about the impact of AI on the world of architecture. And we are lucky to have Matthias here with us tonight, uh, taking us on an hypnotic, hallucinogenic, and perhaps even trippy all the way journey. Matthias Del Campo is a registered architect, designer, and educator. He's associate professor at Tobin College of Architecture and Urban Planning at the University of Michigan. He's also the director of the AR2IL, the Architecture and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory at UOM, and an affiliate faculty member of Michigan Robotics, Computer Science, and Data Science. Matthias Alcampo is the co-founder of the Architectural Practice Span. The practice gained wide recognition for the design of the Austrian Pavilion at the 2010 Shanghai World Expo, and more recently for the Robot Garden at the Ford Robotic Building. Span's work was featured in the Venice Architecture Biennale in 2012 and 2021 at the Archilab 2013, and at the Architecture Biennale in Vienna and Buenos Aires in 2019. Solo shows include Formations, Mac Vienna, and Sublime Bodies, Fab Union, and Shanghai. 
Spam's work is in the permanent collection of the FRAC, the MAC, the Benetton collection, and the Albertina, the Pinacotec, are Munich, and several private collections. His publishing work includes two editions of AD, Evoking Through Design and Machine Hallucinations, co-edited with Neil Leish, as well as the books Neural Architecture, Design and Artificial Intelligence, Oro edition 2022, and Sublime Bodies, co-author with Sandra Manigan, Tonji Press 2017. Thank you so much, Matthias, for, for your kind uh, contribution. Um, the screen is yours. Bea, uh, thank you very much for this absolutely amazing introduction, um, very generous introduction. I, I wanted to say that uh, I'm a huge fan of your work. Uh, it's it has I've been following the work for a very long time. The sublime quality of the work is just absolutely gorgeous and mesmerizing. So it's an honor for me to be here today, and, and, and thank you for the generous invitation to have the opportunity to um, show the work um, that we're doing at Span and also with our lab. Um, in um, uh, in the University of Michigan as well as at SPAN. Um, I'm just going to maybe go back a couple of slides here to the beginning of the lecture. So um, SPAN was founded together with Sandra Manninger in 2003, and we, we have like a long-term on-off relationship uh, with AI and architectural design. Um, we have been uh, work uh, or talking to the Austrian Institute of Artificial Intelligence since the late 90s, but now in the recent years, the last four or five years, it has become apparent that something's happening that is larger than what we have anticipated before. And um, I actually did this, this book here, um, which was recently published with Oro, uh, Bea mentioned that, which summarizes some of the thoughts and ideas um, that were developed in the last five years in order to demonstrate or or at least to attempt to put together something like a theory of uh, architecture and artificial intelligence. I would like to thank here uh, very much Mario Carpo, who was so kind to provide the preface of the book um, and then go into some of the context and ideas that are present within them that sort of present the frame of thinking or interrogation that uh, considers neural architecture. And neural architecture, as mentioned before, um, is the area of interrogation of neural networks and architecture design. In this book, I lay out a variety of different ideas that are connected to what those, what those ideas actually represent when you actually take uh, neuroscientific insights of how our brain actually operates. So we have, for example, quite a well understanding of, of, of how hallucination or dreaming actually works and encapsulate that into a learning system. So a learning system, for example, that interrogates architecture imagery towards their features, particular features. So that, how does, for example, a machine learn? What is Gothic or what is Baroque? Uh, what is modern? And how can we as architects take that knowledge that we basically can interrogate the entirety of our own history as a discipline to hopefully come up with ideas uh, for future solutions in architecture? So what we're doing here in this book and also in general with the work we do at the ARI lab is sort of interrogating the large repositories of data that are existing in our over 2000 years of history as a discipline and then applying them to, um, to possible architectural design methodologies. That's how we describe it maybe. So as Bea mentioned before, neural architecture is the field of architecture that is primarily preoccupied with interrogating the emergent field of artificial neural networks as method of design architecture, of designing architecture. And in my, uh, of course you can use uh, any form of, um, uh, of AI idea to interrogate particular data sets, right? Uh, even to just for practical purposes, like optimization of structure, optimization of material consumption, uh, schedules for construction, et cetera, et cetera. But you can also do it to interrogate maybe the unseen areas within the latent space that inform us about possibilities for us as architects. But before we go deeper into this, let's, let's ask a very basic question. Like, why use AI at all, right? I mean, it's, I don't think it's just a, a passing fashion. Uh, I think it's far deeper than that. The main simple answer would be because it's better to teach machines how to learn instead of how to do things. So it's better to teach machines how to learn instead of how to do things. So what does that mean? 
you probably have seen these sort of videos around. This is basically how we were doing cars until the very late 60s, early 70s. A bunch of people that have certain expertise, which in this case is welding, they, are, they have enough experience and have learned it over many years and are quite capable to do this work quickly, efficiently, clean and precise. But still, there was a big change that happened in the late 60s, which was the change from these people, uh, experts, hand workers, to using robots, industrial robots. And you all have seen these uh, videos before of cars being assembled by industrial robots. So they're welding together pieces. What does that change mean? It means that a robot, first of all, needs to be trained to find to for specific points in space to weld. So uh, you have, every one of you who has worked with a robot before has seen the controller that is that comes along with a robot that basically allows you to teach a robot a particular set of motions to do a specific task. In this case, what they get taught by a human is weld the car at this, 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 and this point. Now, uh, this in itself, of course, uh, allows to speed up the, pr uh, the process. So we can do many more cars in the same time that the people needed before doing manually. On the other hand, uh, every time a new model comes along that assembly line, it means that uh, a new set of information has to be given to the robot to do that process, which of course takes time, money, and effort. What, uh, what happened though, is that through uh, assembling this, these machines, or assembling the cars over many, many years, the car industry was able to collect millions of data points about welding points. And this means that we actually can train a neural network to understand not just the particular welding points of a specific model of a car, but basically train a machine to understand what means welding, what means good welding. So uh, this combined with a robot like the ones you see here, what we can do with that is creating a machine vision process where a car comes along this assembly line and the robot recognizes which are the areas that allow him to weld that car in a good fashion. What's the advantage of that? First of all, we don't have to retrain the robots anytime a new car comes along. Also, it allows us to that every single car on that assembly line can be a different one. Yeah. Now, that's actually one of the things that shows like a practical application of machine learning for the fabrication of an object. What's the other end of the spectrum, the cultural meaning of this sort of, uh, of technologies? You might have seen this painting before. It's the portrait of Bertrand de Bellamy, which was created by the Paris-based art collective Obvious in 2018. It became actually quite famous because it sold at Christie's for almost half a million dollars. And it was allegedly the first entirely AI-based piece of art. I think that's going to be for art historians in the future to decide. But the name Edmond de Pelamy is a tribute to the inventor of the GAN, the Generative Adversarial Network, uh, named Ian Goodfellow. So Pelamy, Goodfellow. But um, what I think was the main questions that arose after this painting was sold and, and actually published were immediately questions about agency, authorship, sensibility, right? Uh, there's the question here, who is the author of this painting? Is it the art collective because they came up with the idea to use an algorithm to create a painting? Or is it the programmer who basically created the algorithm? Or is it the data set of painters, like all the painters in the data set, like probably thousands of images? So who has the copyright of something that was not created by humans? Around the same time in neural art, uh, neural art became quite visible around 2018 with artists such as Sofia Crespo, Mario Klinge. Around the same time, 2018, 2019, uh, Sandra and I were experimenting with uh, latent walks and creating data sets to run uh, particular machine learning processes that allowed it to recognize features, for example, in this case of Gothic uh, churches. And we had the same questions that this, the arts already started to think about at the time, albeit unbeknownst to us. So questions about agency, authorship, sensibility in a post-human design ecology. So what is the architect's role in a context where the sole authorship is not in the human anymore, but when agency is shared? These questions helped in the critical interrogation of the science embedded in a world increasingly entangled with various aspects of AI. They provided the bedrock for the ontology of neural architecture. Um, so in the following, I would like to focus a little bit on some of the uh, theoretical aspects that are also discussed in the book. 
and something that I think is important to understand what those imageries, what those things that we're getting out of these processes mean for us. You might have heard about the concepts of estrangement and defamiliarization. Uh, there's like a whole family of thinkers that already discussed this topic, uh, such as Viktor Schlowski, Bert Brecht, and uh, Sigmund Freud. Um, and what estrangement and defamiliarization or Ostplanini mean uh, is, uh, by the way, this was actually a term that was coined in 1917 by the Russian formalist Viktor Shlovsky in his famous article, Art is Technique. And it basically describes an artistic method that provokes the audience with imagery depicting something, everyday things, in unfamiliar or strange ways. The goal of this uh, was to provide the audience uh, with, um, uh, with the opportunity to gain new perspectives and observe the world through a different lens through techniques that introduce abstraction into the aesthetics of realism. The concept has influenced 20th century art and theory, including Dada, postmodernism, epic theater, science fiction, uh, philosophy, and many more. Uh, and it's, for example, also used as a tactic by recent movements such as culture jamming. Of course, there's a longer history to, to defamiliarization and estrangement. Uh, uh, Hegel already wrote about this, also Karl Marx, uh, Viktor Schlowski, as mentioned. And Bertolt Brecht used it uh, very famously in his theater work to sort of divorce the audience from uh, an illusion of the theater. So basically, he showed the mechanics and mechanisms of the theater to make the audience aware that he's not looking at something that is an illusion of reality, but rather an abstraction of reality, and thus uh, address the, the intellectual context of the theater piece in, a, in an alternative and more realistic way. Uh, of course, a thorough interrogation of aspects of estrangement and defamiliarization cannot be complete without at least mentioning Sig Sigmund Freud's essay, Das Unheimliche, The Uncanny. Freud defines the uncanny as deeply rooted in what is known to individuals as common or familiar. Deviations from the familiar, defamiliarizing aspects of life, result in emotional responses akin to fear and curiosity. And what I mean by that is things like this image here. Um, so there is enough familiar features in this image for us to recognize it as a house, at least for people who are educated in architecture. There is very clearly like three levels, maybe four levels happening here. We have those bent windows. Uh, there is a modern present. But at the same time, there are things happening here that are strange. The connection with the ground, for example, it's not clear what's happening there. Is it growing out of the ground? Was it chiseled from a rock that came off the ground? Uh, so there's like a set of things that are strange to us here, or the roof that has this sort of broken, rugged, uh, dis disturbed uh, quality to it. Um, so this is a good example for combination between familiar features to us and at the same time, estranged elements that heighten our attention to watch this image more closely. One of the arguments I make in my book is that this methodology of working in design is the first genuinely 21st century design method. Why am I, why am I saying that? Um, just think about it. All the uh, computational design methods we have seen in the last 22 years have been actually applied already in the 20th century. Parametric modeling, agent-based modeling, scripting, versioning, blobs, folds, etc., etc. Neural architecture is a new paradigm not only intellectually, as I tried to demonstrate in the images before, and culturally, but also technically. What we see today was not yet possible even a decade ago, because things like, for example, generative adversarial networks came, came about 2014, um, um, neural style transfer um, appeared around 2015, uh, diffusion models, which really exploded onto the scene this year, uh, were not used widely before the last year. Some examples, the robot garden, which also Bea mentioned in her introduction, uh, was actually a commission by the uh, Robotics Institute of the University of Michigan, who at the time were building a new building and asked us, and we were already collaborating with them. By the way, our work is profoundly interdisciplinary. So we work together with Michigan Robotics, we work together with uh, computer science, uh, we work with uh, data science. Um, in order to inform like the design ideas that we have and uh, fuel them also with their res respective expertise. But to go back to the robot garden, 
um, the robot garden basically is a, is a testing ground for robots and the, the requirements where it has to have a variety of different ground conditions, gravel, sand, rocks, earth, it has to have steps uh, also in a varying size and length. Um, because what they're exploring here with this garden is the so-called last 100 step problem. So if you want to have robots that deliver, let's say, packages to your door, the, the, the most difficult part for the robot is the last 100 steps to that door because ground conditions are varying. It can be cobblestone, it can be concrete, it can be sand, uh, it can be uh, you know, gravel. So there's various ground conditions and there could be steps involved and all those and those steps are not um, all the same. They're all different. Uh, another feature that they were asking us to include was some sort of water feature. Uh, and you see that on the on the left side of the concrete steps, there is this sort of like a, a elliptic pond that can be filled with water. Uh, not only to fill that pond with water to try if robots can wade to, through the water, but rather uh, to flood the entire garden uh, to also create slippery conditions for the robots. So let's see if they can somehow manage to, to walk over that. And what I'm really looking forward to is in winter this year, I heard they're going to try it for the first time, to flood the entire garden and let it freeze over to, to create ice so that robots have to manage how to walk through ice. This is one of a really interesting video for me. It was provided to me recently. Um, this is how the robots perceive actually the robot garden. And for me, this is something that I've seen before from other um, videos from cars, for example, interrogating the street. Uh, but this is for me um, very inspiring to see how machines actually perceive the world. It is all based on data set collections. Um, data set collecting, and I'm going to go into that maybe a little bit later more, is an important part of creating these processes. Um, it is unfortunate that the knowledge or the understanding in the architecture discipline of how important actually data sets are is not that big yet. I hope it's going to grow in the upcoming years. And we used a combination of different techniques to, in the design of the robot garden. So we used deep dreaming. Uh, we used um, uh, hallucinating, uh, we, we used um, neural style transfer, uh, we used 2D to 3D style transfer. So it was like a whole collection of different methods and, and possibilities to figure out how can we deep dream steps into the site? How can we create latent walks with the satellite images that will give us varying ground conditions? Not all designs or not all results are buildable. But this is one of my favorite results that we got out of it because this was so profoundly informed with the way that machines perceive the world instead of what we humans think architecture should be. Uh, let's talk a little bit about text to image generation that became so popular this year. So if even John Oliver talks about them, it's clear that they have reached the core of mainstream in a very short time. So it just took a couple of months from like the release of Mid Journey to being on John Oliver. Um, I like this quote by Ludwig Wittgenstein to explain maybe the frame of thinking around here. The limits of my language mean the limits of my world. And this is a precursor project here that I want to show. This was done in 2020, so a couple of years before diffusion models came to the scene. And uh, we were experimenting with something called an attentional gun that allows to take sentences and convert them into images. And this was, uh, the experiment was basically, let's take the program of the competition. This was a competition for a school and then combine that with some surreal elements. So let's say the gym uh, of the school has 2,500 square meters. It has two baseball fields and changing booths and is standing on yellow canary legs. And that basically allowed us to create images and then extract from the images 3D volumes in a rather straightforward, simple way using Grasshopper to create the volumes necessary for the competition program. Uh, one of the things we encountered while doing this project is the problem that neural networks understand only the interior or the exterior of a project, but not both at the same time. So there's a divorce between interior and exterior. Uh, we actually made it a, um, rather a quality than a problem. So we, we said, okay, we're gonna create those volumes that are very articulate and we're going to treat the program inside very pragmatically and simple. So we combined basically the abilities of neural networks to give us some provocative uh, formal vocabularies with something that really performs on the inside on a very uh, 
straightforward uh, level. After these first attempts with um, uh, text to image translation, I actually found Disco Diffusion very early this year or late last year, I don't remember exactly, um, which um, already showed things that I think are very architectural in the way how it treats data. Um, architects are used to the concept of variation. And what you see here is an endless variation of plants, basically. But you can, of course, go back in time and figure, and, you know, this is, for example, a series of working models from the Atelier Holland from 2004 while preparing the Saturn Tower in Vienna. So this working through variations is very common in architectural practice. In this case, it's uh, about 25 models uh, showing variations of volumetric compositions for the design of a tower. Things like mid-journey uh, and disco diffusion or stable diffusion amplify that to a large scale. So this is a collection of images that I created over summer. And I made a little calculation at, and I came up with that I created from April to August around 25, no wait, 75,000 images, 75,000 images. And I'm not even a power user. Power users uh, go even up on that. But let me quickly explain how these diffusion models actually work. Let the history behind it starts with the automated image captioning, which came about 2015. The idea here was, uh, okay, we have achieved uh, uh, enough data that is labeled specifically to describe particular objects. Like this is a person, this is a statue, this is a bridge, this is a lamp, and so on, like in this case. And somebody came up with the idea, well, if we have all of that connected, could we actually make a machine uh, create captions of an image automatically? So for example, in this case, it would be the caption would be people walking on a bridge, right? And it could do that automatically instead of describing individual objects on the bridge, describing the scene. Somebody, of course, came up with the idea, wait a second, if we can do that, we might be able to just turn the whole thing around. So input a sentence and get an image out of the neural network. That one person was Elmar Mansiborov and his colleagues at uh, Amazon Web Services who was, of course also wrote a paper uh, which is called Generating Images from Captions with Attention, which was published in 2016. Uh, of course, like the first attempts to generate images, and I should try to, to get some slides of that because it's really funny. Uh, their first attempts, which were like, for example, uh, a red elephant in the sky is basically just a little bit of blue with a red blotch in the middle because the resolution was so bad and it was not working so well, but it was doing something. And what these diffusion models do is basically they take images that are in the data set and add noise to them, increasingly noise in, in a variety of steps until the image is just a noise image. And then what happens is they turn the whole process around, take the noise image, and then according to the information in the prompt, they can organize the pixels so that it becomes an, a, a legible image. So in this case, an alpine villa. Yeah. Of course, there are things like this. I mean, you can simply input something like, let's say, Mies van der Rohe building, and it will generate fairly convincing images of something that could be a Mies van der Rohe building. Um, the, my, my, my problem with this, or the danger I see in this, is that uh, I, I, I see already how people that are maybe not that imaginative will use these technologies to recreate or, re, or, or basically um, generate imagery that, that you know, will lead to projects that look like things we know before. Like basically they're going to imitate the, the, the particular um, um, aesthetic qualities of, seen, of things we've seen before. But it can also be used very creatively. Like for example, section drawing through an opera house. And it will create things like this. I'm not saying this is a section through an opera house. One of the things that I noticed using all these diffusion models is that they can create con even better than these ones. This is already like an older version of Midjourney here. They can create sections and elevations and plans that look very convincing. But if you as an architect look closer into them, you will figure out pretty quickly that they make no sense whatsoever. So what, an, what diffusion models can do is they can recreate vision, uh, they can recreate visual cues and features and elements from plans and sections that they have in their data set, but because they do not have any semantic information in there that makes them understand, this is the, let's say in an opera house, this is the audience chamber, this is the stage, this is the green room, this is the uh, wardrobe area, 
because it does not have that information, the images do not make any sense at the end, but they can be highly uh, inspirational. So I see AI and the work with AI as an extension of the designer's abilities, not a replacement. It is something that will expand our abilities as far as if we, if, if we are open to that. It, it actually puts another player on the field of creative creation. Um, and I think that's also what I describe as the as post human design environment. Uh, it does it post human doesn't mean after humans. Post human for me means after the top down dominance of human hegemony in terms of design processes. Uh, meaning that instead of having a pyramid with a player on the top, which would be a human, we have a plateau basically that allows a variety of different players to come along and do help in design processes. However, you can also have fun with this. Uh, I prompted once uh, Mid Journey, the most beautiful house in the world, and I got this here. And yeah, I mean, you can debate this. Some people find this really funny. Others uh, are completely uh, in horror about this. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna leave it up to you what you think. Uh, very early on using diffusion models, I prompted, I really started to prompt things that combine contrasting qualities with each other to to see what, what actually this neural network would come up with. Things like a hairy villa or Le Corbusier made of Kobe beef or a scaly house or a house made of feathers and so on and so forth. And then very uh, like immediately after that, tectonic facade studies, which became very popular. Um, yeah, so, and um, yeah, I also like very much the, the ability of these diffusion models it's an interesting process because it is it is uh, it starts with a noise image as i mentioned before even if you use the same prompt several times it will always create something that is different every single time so every image is more or less unique except except you use like very high seed numbers um but um it's something i don't do i, I like to be surprised uh, by by the results and inspired and provoked let me go through a couple of those images very quickly. And you've seen this here to show you basically where we are now. Like all the images you saw before were maybe version two, version three of Mid Journey. Last week, or even this week, no, actually this week, uh, Mid Journey announced the version four, which is incredibly detailed in terms of uh, what it can do. I mean, those images are becoming more and more convincing. Like the sections look amazing. But again, same problem I mentioned before. Um, if you look closely into them, if you start interrogating them in terms of what they do spatially and programmatically, they don't make so much sense. But they can inspire you with their like thick pochets and strange rooms and combinations of elements you didn't expect. Maybe to some more concrete examples, um, this project here was uh, is basically the design for um, a building in Vienna, Austria, the Marielferstrasse, which is a combination uh, of uh, office uh, space, uh, shopping and um, shopping arcade and some apartments. It's right at the Marielferstrasse, which is a very, a very central shopping street in Vienna. We created a, a data set of brutalism buildings for this project. Um, yeah, we're having a lot of fun with brutalism recently, it's particular when it comes to neural networks. <clears throat> So we scraped the internet for every single brutalism photograph we could find. We put together a data set. It was trained uh, on a StyleGun 2 algorithm. Um, uh, we, we got the training results are those images you see here, which show these um, strange variations of, of brutalist architecture. This is the latent work. The latent space, by the way, is a very interesting problem to interrogate. It is the space between two known data points, basically, or several data points if you want. But basically, if you have two data points and they start to interpolate between them um, based on, on the algorithm you're using, it will create these images. So we, um, we selected a couple of the images and then used a pixel projection method to come up with a model. Uh, for that building. The model itself already has features that are, of course, very architectural. So there's, there's levels, there's columns, there's walls. But of course, it cannot fulfill the entirety of the program asked in this project. So again, it is manual work. 
to go ahead and start to interrogate the model and add to the model what is necessary to make this a working functioning architectural project with staircases, elevators, egress uh, routes, um, uh, floor thicknesses that are correct and so on. So as I mentioned before, we use AI as an extension of our design abilities. It can provide us with, with like a segue or an idea or a vehicle for a continuous interrogation of the project. And this is the status quo for us now. That is not said that we cannot use the same methodologies in, 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 in the upcoming years to interrogate them for structural qualities, for material consumption, optimization, like everything you can optimize AI is good in. Um, it's uh, what AIs can do best is optimization and prediction. And these two areas are things that we're trying to look deeper into uh, considering our own design work. Um, and uh, um, this project here is in a similar vein with a similar methodology. Uh, it's a, a project for a, a house for a neuro neurologue, which is, a, 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 I don't know exactly what the English term is. It's a doctor that treats um, um, neural um, diseases. Uh, and he heard about these methods that we're using to design. Uh, wait, uh, I have to jump forward here, sorry. That's this one here. Uh, so he heard about the methods we're using and was really interested in how we're applying them to design. And he basically said, okay, I have a site in the Alps. I want to build a house there. Would you be interested using these methods you have been using, which basically come from his discipline in a design? The only rule he made for us was that it has to be a mid-century modern house. That was sort of what he said. Of course, we're not going to do a mid-century modern house, but what we did was create a data set of mid-century modern houses and uh, applying the same method I showed before with the project at the Marie Hilferstrasse, which is basically um, creating a latent walk, uh, trying to find in the latent space imagery that, that we think are valuable and interesting for the design process, and then apply a pixel projection method um, to come up with the house. The difference for us between this and, for example, the project that I showed, um, this, the high school project that I showed, which was based on language, is that uh, using this method, we're able to generate interior and exterior at the same time. Uh, this is a view towards the kitchen. This is a view towards one of the sleeping rooms in the house. So this is basically uh, the status quo at the, at the moment for us in terms of using these methodologies in design. I want to mention that I also found that together with Sandra Manninger, uh, Daniel Poloch, and Emmanuel Co, the Neural Architecture Group, uh, which is a loose collective uh, that meets regularly to discuss all things AI and architecture. There is also the website AIarchitects.org, which um, uh, if you want to see more positions, more architects working on these ideas, I can highly recommend to you to, to check the page out. And um, there is, of course, the, the Ariel Laboratory, which interrogates the more pragmatic problems when it comes to AI and architecture. We're currently working on something called the Common House data set and the, and the Model Mind data set, uh, a plan data set, and the other one being a 3D model data set, which will be openly available uh, for everyone to, to download and work with once it's finished. Uh, it is important for us to take the ethos of computer science of sharing absolutely everything. Um, and there is the YouTube uh, channel called Remashing AI, which collects lectures, but also tutorials if you're interested in how to apply uh, Python, for example, in using Colab, Colab um, libraries and so on. At uh, the end, I would like to, of course, shamelessly self promote one more time the book that I just published Neural Architecture, Design and Artificial Intelligence uh, in, on Oro and um, the AD Machine Hallucinations, Architecture and Artificial Intelligence um, co-edited together with Neil Leach. And later this year, uh, there will be a publication called Architecture in the Age of Intelligent Machines with Springer that basically summarizes the hardcore technical background of all that I showed you today, including coding, mathematical background, et cetera, et cetera. And with, with this, I would like to say thank you very much and open up maybe for questions. Thanks. Terrific. It's absolutely super inspiring. Thank you so much, Matthias. Um, 
as I promised you, I am not going to ask any questions. I'm just going to give all, all that time that we have uh, with um, the audience. So please do, um, as you know, Matthias needs to leave just before the hour. So do take the opportunity to ask a few questions or just write it on, on the text box and I'll do my best to read it um, properly. I'm just adding some links in the chat just in case people want to look oh, around. Fantastic, fantastic. I think everyone is still taking it in, <laughs> the possibilities. So I'll, 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 I'll have a kick uh, uh, and, and start with the, the, the first one. Um, so um, I think, let me see which one do I want to ask? Uh, like if I go on text base or, or you know, sort of uh, maybe dabbing on as mo most of us here, are probably architects, designers, um, especially for my generations and my age. Uh, I feel this is another turn, right? So, so when I when I was doing my my uh, undergraduate in the '90s, you know, the big turn of the digital. I'm still from um, the generation that had to know how to draw to get into architectural school, and then the big turn of of the digital, and and you know, I I think I'm very blessed in the sense that I never thought one or the other but it's all part of the toolbox. So I'm, I'm, I'm super excited with, you know, this new turn and how this can add to our toolbox, to the possibilities, to opening even more possibilities for, for our creativity, uh, uh, for trying to answer uh, different questions, you know, or, or the ability to ask different questions because the tools are, are changing. So I think my, my, my question for you, Matthias, is, is how, how do, you, do you see, or, or you know, probably uh, have an idea that we can start introducing this sort of tools at an earlier stage and at an undergraduate stage that is part of becoming an architect, not as a as a, a sprout or or route outside of of, of the profession of architecture. Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. Uh, I, I think I would like to point here uh, to several colleagues who have actually talked about this before. Um, like for example, Andrew Cutlers has discussed this in the sense that um, by now it was always very difficult to basically infuse students with a particular sensibility or idea of how to come up with something that has um, also architectural but also visual value so what we did traditionally is is tell students look at this book or look at that reference or look at these paintings or look at this artist and so on so you had like all this refer you, you build this referential system around the student to inform his project right and right now uh, with these text to image processes that are really easy to use a student can start to explore that on his own in in a far more innocent way i would say yeah, uh, so I always had the feeling that when you do this as a teacher, you're somehow top down infusing information onto a student versus what we see now with these text to image things is that it's almost like bottom up, like you have this enormous gene pool of art, architecture, design, and so on, biology, nature, history, what you want. It's this enormous pool of imagery that generates something like a gene pool out of which students can construct something that is uniquely theirs. Yeah. And we will see if this works because on the other hand, in order to, to, to create a good prompt in a text to image uh, um, uh, model, you I think you have to have at least a basic knowledge about art history, design, things that you're interested in, right? And maybe being able to have enough fantasy to combine that with, you know, a biological reference or an artistic reference or even an economic reference, who knows, yeah? But I think that that the, the 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 creativity in this whole process is not so much in the AI producing the image, but rather in your imagination of how to get the image out of it. Does it answer your question a little bit? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You know, and and it's interesting because I was trying to divide two questions, but you end up actually tying up uh, uh, with uh, another element that I find it extremely uh, uh, exciting, which is the power of the word. 
you know, that we, we, we tend as architects use the power of the word as notational system in the visual construct, but here it's so merged and intertwined and so fundamental to actually uh, um, give birth to something new. And that I, I, I think it also, if I'm allowed to, to, to think in, in, those, in those levels, how important will become the word in the architectural profession, you know, as a different type of communication. So it, I, I find it extremely exciting. And, and as you say, you know, there, there is this uh, uh, bottom up rather than the top down traditional sort of educational practice. I can see one, one, one question, I'm going to read it. It's from Brian Hoyt. Um, how do you think the status quo of technology, of the technology and methodology you described can interact with other current themes like social, participatory, uh, and energy sustainability? In, the, in terms of the data set as a technique, can it be diversified to receive these kinds of metrics? That is a really good question. Um, so just to give you like a, a frame of understanding, uh, anything that produces data can be used by AI. Yeah, it's all just numbers at the end of the day, right? So if you are interested into social participatory energy sustainability metrics, it's up to you to build the data set that has that information to extract out of that process, something that has value to you as an architect. Yeah, so what I mean by that, I mentioned briefly in my lecture that there's two areas that AI is really good in. One is prediction, the other one is optimization, right? So for example, let's say you want to, and, there's, and the things are getting used like that. If you want to, for example, predict the further development of climate in the world, you just take as much climate data that you can and, and you know, historical context of it to feed a machine that will be able to predict how much the temperature will rise in the next 50 years if we don't do certain things. That's exactly how these models work, by the way. That's why we know those things. These are basically just AI applications that are able to predict these sort of things based on historical correct data that is labeled correctly. Or, you, I mean, if you go into the sort of a little bit of science fiction area, but not entirely, Westworld, for example, that had this, this model that was predicting the life of every single person, right? Um, it's not completely out of question to do these sort of things. And this is because if you if you think about social media, for example, those large social media companies have been uh, collecting and scraping data from everyone who's participating in there for, for almost a decade now, or more actually, no more than a decade. And that amount of data allows for them to predict particular things. So if you're in, in, in interested, for example, in energy and sustainability in construction, it's up to you to make an, a project out of it, right? I mean, I, I have my area of expertise when it comes to AI. My, my area of expertise is really more the cultural interrogation of it. That's why I'm, what I'm interested in too. But, but, but doing so, I know also how much bigger the whole thing is, like how, how, how incredibly game-changing this whole thing is for the discipline. Yeah? All your questions can be also interrogated with the tools that are presented. Oh. Um, any any more questions for Matthias before he has to go? Peter. Thanks, Bea. I, su I suppose it's really a thought rather than um, than a question. It, it, it was just to sort of ask a little bit around um, how sort of shape grammars, and I'm thinking particularly of, of projects like um, Eisenman's Palladio Virtual, um, how they might be fed into AI. Um, uh, sort of thinking about the party diagram as well uh, as as a sort of model for 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 generating workable plans. Whether whether there has been any work or or, or whether there is any thinking around how that kind of body of knowledge could be fed into um uh, into sort of some of these ai uh, typologies as a way of 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 generating both aspects both the sort of interiority and and the exteriority in a way that's kind of coherent and 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 um yeah 
Thanks a lot for the question. I mean, there is there is certain precedents of people who have been discussing this sort of problems. Like, for example, Molly Wright Steenson's book, uh, Architectural Intelligence, pointed out, for example, the work of Christopher Alexander and how his ideas of, you know, spatial uh, combinations and, and ideas of diagrammatic use of space uh, very much influence not only architecture, but profoundly also computer science. That's a funny thing, actually. Christoph Alexander has always been rather more popular with computer scientists than with architects. Um, uh, but one thing that is interesting is that there is, of course, also precedent in using uh, machine learning for the creation of plans. Um, Stanislas Chailu's thesis project in, at Harvard GSD, for example, comes to mind, which was one of the pioneering projects in that direction. Uh, there, there have been several others. Um, uh, uh, Su Gong, Su Gong, I think, uh, he, he did like some amazing work on, on, on uh, machine learning and plan making. Yeah. Um, so it's absolutely possible to encapsulate that. Uh, again, it's a it's a it's a question of the data set, as as with all these sort of things. Uh, I can tell you, for example, that we are currently creating a data set that, that is an, annotated for plans because you need to have semantic information in the data set. Otherwise, the neural network does or any sort of machine learning process does not understand what you're up to. Right. So uh, and uh, another thing I would like to say in that area, which is, is quite interesting, is the abilities of prediction I mentioned before of neural networks or of machine learning. Uh, Machine. I don't know if it's the right term to use machine learning for that, but what I'm trying to say here is um, there is a new tendency, there's a new thing out there, which is called uh, energy-based models, yeah? And energy-based models are really good in prediction. So one of the ideas that the developers had was, wait, if I have an old movie from the 1920s and a set of frames is missing in the part of the movie, I can use energy-based prediction models to fill that gap with a prediction of what's going to happen in those seconds that are missing. And they can perfectly, you know, restore movies doing that. But if you think further with that, if you think architecturally about it, I'm totally interested in doing things like, for example, say, I have a living room here and it's 10 by 12 meters or five by six meters. Yeah? I want this neural network or I want this process to predict where is the sleeping room? Where is the toilet? Where is the entrance? Yeah. So basically, building up from that one from that one room, predict to me how the rest of the apartment would look like. Yeah. And those things are possible. And this is just a small example of what you can do with. Imagine doing that with an entire city, like saying, "This is the city center. Predict to me how the rest looks like." Uh, so it can become a tool from small scale in architecture to the largest imaginable one. I don't know if this answers. I don't know if this answers your question, but uh, no, 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 it does, Matthias. Thank you. I mean, I, I think it, it's it. I just sort of find that the possibilities that both um, fascinating and also slightly scary. <laughs> Um, don't be scared. Don't be scared. I can I can tell you one thing that I try to repeat to people that 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 have sort of like a an ambivalent relationship to AI. I would say is that AI is not as intelligent as we think. It's mm -hmm. an incredible, interesting uh, machine. Uh, it can inspire us to do really interesting things, but don't be afraid. It's going to take over us. This is not going to happen. The more I know about AI, the more I know how not intelligent it is. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. This time. is important to understand. Yeah. Thank you. That's a good one. Um, we have um, a question from um, Alexander Smaga. Uh, where do you see the impact of or potentials of AI on the architect client relationship? Uh, thanks a lot. That's a good question. Uh, it's it's funny enough. I had the same question like I don't know, like two days ago or something, and um, it's a very it's a really good question. And if you think about that, uh, considering especially uh, diffusion models that generate images with text. Uh, by the way, you can also use images as prompts. By the way, not only text. So there's the changes going on right now. Think about the process of how you basically try to convince uh, a client. So normally, let's say you you generate like three variations of a project. Uh, in best case, if it's a large client, you're gonna come up with plans, uh, with sections, elevations. You're gonna come up with renderings, 
and and this is going to be used to convince the clients right that's an enormous amount of work for something you might not get at all so this is one of the problems we have as architects we invest enormous amounts of resources in things that might not exist in the future that might not be you know might not become a project now if you think about diffusion models isn't that cool that you can you know have a phone call with your client and the client says yeah i want to do a small hotel on a lake somewhere in austria let's say yeah and you're like okay uh, i'll come by tomorrow with three nice images and you let me know what you like so basically you would reverse the whole process you first generate the money shots in these uh, diffusion models you go to the client and tell him so which one do you like yeah instead of investing weeks maybe in creating 3d models and detailed plans and everything you you start a conversation with the with the luring the alluring image yeah, with the image that will convince the client to give you the project instead of investing god knows how much money in 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 things that are useless for this process so it's going to change definitely the way we can talk and discuss with clients because we're going to be much faster in developing the seductive imagery that gets you the project That's a good selling point. <laughs> um, I know you have to go, Matthias. I, I really want to thank you. I want to just show to the audience that I this is the one I have right here, but I have wait, all wait. your the, both what? your ADs and I'm waiting for your for your your new one. Um, and especially for my students that are here, uh, are absolutely a must have. And uh, I just want to thank you again, Matthias, for, for your precious time for for talking uh, uh to to us and and uh for sharing the amazing work you're 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 pushing forward uh uh and the cusp of of changing you know um uh, ideas and ways of, of of working that's phenomenal thank you so much it's really can exciting you, can you hold can you hold the ad one more one more time in the camera? absolutely perfect thank you so much <laughs> It's wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you all for 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 joining. Um, and and again, Matthias, absolutely thrilling and exciting. Thank you so much for you for for, for contributing. That's um, really delightful. It, it was a pleasure, and I have to thank for the invitation. It was great talking to you guys, and great questions. And hopefully soon again. Thank you. <laughs> See ya. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs>